It is no easy thing to make sense of the world today. We live in a time where just trying to put one foot in front of the other can be both difficult and confusing. So many of the categories, things that were once considered normal, relationships like parent and child, man and woman, understandings of race and nationality, identity itself, these things are changing fast in our culture, faster than we can even make sense of or keep up with. Who am I? That's the perennial question of our culture. Of course, that doesn't mean there's no answer. Christianity does give us answers. God has made known to us not only who he is, but who he's made us to be. And that's why I want you to join us May 21st through the 23rd for the Wilberforce Weekend. Join all of us at the Colson Center in an exploration of what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. The event is being held at the stunning Omni Resort in Fort Worth, Texas. You can engage speakers who are both thinkers and doers, that are writers and laborers, teachers and preachers. And we've called all of these folks together to help us frame out the answers to this perennially important question. Hi everybody, John Stone Street here, president of the Colson Center. Just another little preview here of what we're gonna look forward to at Wilberforce Weekend uh, this coming May uh, as we walk through from a variety of angles, I've even said a dizzying variety of angles, looking at not only the idea and the doctrine of the image of God, but how it should ground our understanding of a Christian worldview in many ways, and also how it's critical to our cultural witness. And it's that piece right there uh, that is particularly uh, critical uh, to the conversation I'm about to have with my friend Matthew Sleeth, medical doctor, widely read author, but author specifically, uh, most recently, of a new book called Hope Always, How to Be a Force for Life in a Culture of Suicide. Matthew, I don't get to see you nearly enough, and it's good to see you, albeit virtually. Thanks so much for joining Great me. Great to be with you. So again. I, 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 I want to begin, you, you shared this with me offline. I don't want to embarrass you, but I think it is very appropriate. You said that somebody had shared with you uh, this proverb, and we have just spent a number of weeks uh, with our Colson Center family praying through the Proverbs week by week by week, uh, talking about kind of the the prescient and practical wisdom that is given to us. And someone shared this proverb with you as describing what this book is about, what your work over the last couple of years in this area of suicide has been about. And I think it's worth reading. It's Proverbs 24, verse 11. Rescue those, and 12, rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? Know it. And will he not repay men according to his work? What a remarkable, remarkable uh, reminder that it is our uh, Christian duty to love our neighbor. And that means protecting some that are vulnerable. We have been talking around the Colson Center for several years about what people have identified as the so-called deaths from despair. In other words, just this... uh, uh, this hopelessness that permeates so much of Western culture and American culture that has led to high rates of self-harm, suicidal ideation, and suicide abuse. This predates the pandemic. Is it accurate anymore for anyone to say, behold, we did not know this? I don't think so. We are in the midst of a culture of of suicide. And um uh, as the image bearers of the maker of life, we are in the business of life, and uh, uh, along with uh, our God, and and so we, I think, have to um, be very conscious and um, and go out of our comfort zones uh, about uh, about getting involved in this. Um, you know, Jesus left the 99 sheep that were safe and, and went after the one that was trying to get itself killed. And that's what a sheep is doing if it's not in the sheephold, you know. And so we, we are responsible, and we were given the tools uh, as well to, to, to give good news, to give hope. And, um, and so that's, that's really what the book Hope Always is about, is, is a wake-up call for the church, for Christians, um, to go out and do what it is we're charged with do, uh, doing, and that is letting people know that life is a precious gift 
and not to be thrown away. Uh, you know, uh, you've written several books, always on very interesting uh, ideas. We've had you on the Breakpoint podcast, for example, talking about uh, the idea of Sabbath. Your book, 24-6, was a big influence in my thinking on, in that area, as well as my family's. Uh, you talked about reforesting faith, the, the role that trees play throughout scriptures. I mean, these are very, very kind of interesting topics, uh, spiritual formation sorts of of things. Um, this is a different sort of topic for you. And I, I guess I, at some level, I'm curious uh, what what led you into to write about this, to do this survey uh, uh, on kind of the state of the culture, what the scripture says about this, what Christians can do. And um, that's an interesting part of this that I want to get to in just a second. But wh- wh- where, why did you write this? Like, where did this come from in your own life? Well, I think, um, first of all, I dealt with this on a day-to-day basis for uh, uh, a long time (laughs) as a physician in an emergency department. And and since I started medicine, it has done nothing but get worse, uh, the suicide statistics. And it is not uncommon to uh, open up a a news feed on on the internet uh, and every day now to see a story about not only suicides, but murder suicides. Uh, it's, it's not enough that people are killing themselves. They're taking the plane down with them or they're, or they're, they're killing family members um, and that sort of thing. And uh, <clears throat> so that wasn't still enough to get me doing this because it's a pretty heavy topic and I'm a pretty um, happy, you know, guy, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, but I, I one day typed in, what does God think about suicide? Just to kind of see what the internet told me. And the, the very first article that came to the top um, was written uh, by a couple of theologians. I won't tell you what uh, group they were, banner they were fly, flying under, uh, but they said that Scripture not only didn't forbid suicide, but that Jesus, in fact, could be viewed as committing suicide himself. And to me, that represented a profound misunderstanding of what Scripture is all about from Genesis to Revelation. And so that's kind of my calling orders, is when the church has forgotten something that's there from one end of Scripture to the other, or it has been a practice within the church throughout um, the Christian experience for the last 2,000 years. Um, and, and I really uh, felt compelled, and, but that wasn't enough. And I, I read all these books I could find about suicide um, from both the secular and a Christian viewpoint. And um, then I said, God, if you want me to write this book, you're going to have to reveal something in Scripture to me that nobody has picked up on here. And I made it about three pages into the Bible and uh, got the, the dummy slap on the head. No Christian book that I read about suicide mentions Satan in the Garden of Evil. In the Garden of Eden, Satan's initial calling card was to try to get Adam and Eve to kill themselves. In the day you do this, you will surely die. And he said, oh, yeah. And so that, that's the beginning of the story of God, humanity, and Satan. Is God saying, I'm for life, and Satan saying, no, there's, uh, kill yourself. And every time Satan shows up in Scripture, and it's not that many times, but every time Satan shows up in Scripture, he's trying to get somebody to kill himself. The book of Job is a, is a book about uh, Satan trying to get Job to kill himself. Curse God and die. You don't curse God and then pop your dead. That's the poetry of Job um, of committing suicide. And so it's just, it's Satan's calling card. When he meets Jesus in the Bible, what does he do? He says, jump off the, jump off the tower. And so um, this is a battle that, frankly, the secular world cannot understand. It, is, it cannot be explained by um, evolutionary uh, theory. There's no zebra that ever got up one day and said, I'm not going to run from the lion. This is a distinctly human problem. And so that's a little longer answer than you probably wanted, but I didn't want to write the book, but you know, sometimes God just keeps shoving us in, in that direction. Well, the cultural 
tie-in here is unbelievable. I mean, when you say that it's only gotten worse, give us a sense of that scale. I mean, because first of all, we sense that it's gotten worse. At the Colson Center, we've been talking, as I said, about that phrase, death, uh, you know, um, death from despair. And I think there's also an element to it, as I've added, called acts of desperation, when you talk about acts of mass violence and things like that. And these are kind of two sides of the same hopeless coin. But um, it, it is getting worse. We feared going into COVID in particular that increasing isolation, lockdowns, uh, and inability to be with each other. I know, for example, Colorado, and you know this, Matthew, it has terrible suicide rates uh, and has for a while. And there had been remarkable progress made in the schools because of some work with some churches just prior to COVID, for the year prior to, prior to COVID. And then, of course, COVID shut all that down. And so now all of a sudden, these young people are, uh, are without that sort of assistance that was really playing triage. G- give us a sense of, of how bad is it? I mean, what, what's the it's, scale? How is it getting worse? And what did COVID do to it? Yeah, let me, let me, let me tell you that it's, it's so much worse than the statistics would. Uh, it, it, another reason I wrote this book is I've had 11 graduate classes in statistics, bizarrely, and medical statistics in particular. Um, and so you've, you've got to look at things uh, a little bit different than just what the internet will throw at you. Um, there was a period in the 80s where the uh, death, the homicide rate in the United States really shrank. And I forget who the politician was that was in charge at that time, but of course claimed credit for it. It had nothing to do with any change in policies other than that we began a 9-11 system and a unified trauma system, and it got a lot harder to kill yourself. Well, that same thing applies to suicide. So it's not if, if you want to measure what is the level of violence in society, for instance, you would measure not deaths, but shootings. <clears throat> and if you want to measure the desperation uh, around suicide, you measure not suicides that are completed, but you measure attempts. So in the coming year, 10 million Americans are going to think seriously about killing themselves, and a million and a half of those are going to end up in an emergency department. Um, if we did not have the, 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 the medical capabilities to reverse poisonings, to ventilate people until poisonings wear off, a, a significant 20, 30% of people who shoot themselves are saved because of this incredible uh, trauma system we have. But if you subtracted all that, we would probably be in the, in the range of 300 Suicides per 100,000. The official is 14 to 15 per 100,000. But if we, and, and the highest rate in uh, American history, recorded history, was during the Great Depression, which was 14 per 100,000. But they didn't have any of these things there. So it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a complicated explanation, but it's a necessary one to understand the full extent of the desperation permeating uh, society right now. 10 million people a year that considering whether or not to kill themselves is really the astounding figure there. And it's going to get worse. In the last 30 years, it's done nothing but get worse. And the thing about that that I really examine in, in, in the book is that we have done every single thing that uh, mental health experts have told us to do for the last 30 years, and it's only getting worse. And my question is, do you keep doing more of the same uh, uh, under those circumstances? Uh, one very bright person, Albert Einstein, said that was the definition of insanity itself. Do more of what isn't working. Yeah. Well, talk about specifically then about COVID as well, because I mean, I mean we're starting to see numbers. The CDC released numbers uh, that talked about the, you know, the percentage of 18-year-olds, I think, uh, I think it was teenagers, young adults that at suicidal ideation. I mean, the numbers were stunning. And I know, you know, at early stage numbers are, are not there. Uh, you know, maybe not accurate. There's maybe going to be changes. Um, yeah, but it, they, it does seem that it, at least it could, it didn't help things. No, no, it, it didn't. And, you know, any, any stressor like this pulls at the fabric of society. And it's been my anecdotal uh, impression over the last year 
that those who built houses on rocks have done okay, but those who have built them on sand are in in real trouble. Um, and uh, uh, m- meaning by that, th- those who who uh, have a faith that's solid, that's transmitted to children and everything, are in good shape. But we know that's not the way a lot of the world is is living. Um, and I think COVID uh, is just the beginning. We're going to we're going to see more stretching of the fabric of uh, society here, and it's beginning to tear. <clears throat> it it seems. Um... I mean, and I, you know, I just want to repeat the title of the book. It's always, uh, sorry, hope always. How to be a force for life in a culture of suicide. Uh, and that's the reason we asked you to come to the World War Force Weekend, and, and we're thrilled to have you uh, near the end of the conference as we have walked through what is the image of God, what difference does the image of God make, and then walk through it in those kind of three chapters of creation, fall, redemption, in that kind of redemption part of, you know, Christians reclaiming and re- restoring in their lives and in society this witness around the image of God, uh, that there's not a more rubber meets the road issue. Uh, I mean, maybe abortion, uh, but uh, certainly abortion is a rubber meets the road on, you know, whether we respect the image of God in everyone or not. But this seems to be right, right in that same category, uh, at least according to that proverb that we read earlier. Rescue those ta- being taken away to death, including those, I guess, that are taking themselves, you know, in that direction. Um, is there actually something here? I mean, I, I think we all should kind of share your feeling that, okay, all the secular explanations and you know, offerings, these things aren't actually moving the needle in the right direction. Is there it, actually it may be something that the church it, it, can do? Yeah, in the wrong direction. In it has been a stat when I went to medical school and I went to one of the most secular medical schools in the United States. Um, And uh, even in that setting, we were taught that if somebody has a relationship with God, if they are plugged into a uh, 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 a Christian uh, system, that's the one that's been studied the most, but really the monotheistic um, uh, Abrahamic uh, religions, they are four to six times less likely to commit suicide than an atheist, and um, and so that had always been part of uh, the knowledge, uh, been studied for about 140 years scientifically, and yet if you look at the new 61-page uh, uh, report from the CDC on handling suicide, uh, never once do they mention uh, faith as as part of this, and so they are subtracting God from the possibilities. Of being the answer, and as as far as I can tell, we don't have data going back hundreds of years. But the church was the only uh, thing that took care of suicide three hundred years ago. Uh, v- Vincent Van Gogh was in a religious hospital, and incidentally, his room was better looking. He could paint in it than than most um, uh, you know uh, institutions today. But the church did a better ch- uh, better job. And they had no medicines uh, to treat with, and and so um, I another reason that really um, convinced me that this book had to be written was I was meeting with a, a church group, it's about a hundred hundred and ten students um, that were in a uh, performing um, orchestral group that was uh, Christian, and I'd been asked to talk to them, and they said, well, "What are you working on? What are you thinking about?" And I said. I'm I'm thinking about writing a book about suicide, and pow, it was like you know somebody dropped a grenade. Two of the students were on suicide watch and had a nurse accompanying them, and one of the students had just lost a first cousin that week uh, to suicide, and so we opened up this conversation, and I said, "Has anyone, any adult in the church, ever told you that suicide is wrong?" Not a single one. And I have yet to this time to find anyone who has heard suicide addressed from the pulpit in any setting other than after a suicide. Uh, And so the church has got to begin to articulate that life is not only an option, it's the most beautiful thing. When you start living life in Christ, I I mean, I pinch myself, is this for real? (laughs) And, And I came to Christ late. I was 47 years old. 
Um, but we've got to start articulating that, and we cannot assume that the, this next generation knows that it's wrong. Yeah, They've been told everything's right, everything's okay. And, unless, and, and they've got to hear that, and they've got to hear, and it's beautiful. Life is beautiful. It's a gift. You know, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, mean, I had a, a, a friend uh, lost during the last year through suicide. Many of our Breakpoint listeners will, will know who I'm you know, referring to here. Just one of those, you just at the beginning of the year, if you'd have said, hey, one of your friends is going to take his own life, which one is it? I would have not guessed this individual. Um, and just the, the swift turn that it took. And I'm just reflecting now, just based on your words about, um, you know, the memorial services, the uh, both private and public that we were a part of during that time. And, you know, there's a real sense that we want to um, honor, you know, an individual, not, 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 you know, make his whole story about this one terrible, terrible decision. And, and I understand that. And um, even more recently in a church that I know of, same sort of situation, just a, a tragic death, but it's just not mentioned. And I think sometimes it's maybe out of good intention. You don't want to sully that reputation, but I guess I'm thinking about it now, Matthew, and I, I think the important thing here is, is that, okay, but you got to get around to it sometime, you know, and now's the, actually the time to talk about it because of, you know, it's front and center. And, and I often say this, that for the church not to talk about something that's so important is to give the impression that the church has nothing to say. And what your book teaches and what you're going to bring to Wilberforce is that the church has more to say about this and better things to say about this than anybody else. Like we've actually got a way forward. We've actually got this idea uh, of hope. And so we're really robbing the world out of a wonderful, uh, uh, a wonderful resource. Yes, and, and, and one of the things I do in Hope Always is actually to go through Scripture and look at those people who become suicidal and who, instead of acting on that, call out to the Lord. Mm. And um, Moses is in that category. I don't want to die. Elijah's in that, or I don't want to live anymore. Um, uh, Elijah is in that uh, category. Jonah's in that category. And so, it, to you know, the Scripture has wisdom on this, and... And so one of the things I hope to do is get people to open their Bible, learn from that wisdom, and be, begin to uh, apply it. And I'm not blaming the church, by the way, for not discussing this, because uh, you, you, know, you and I are on a busy phone here, and, and you can uh, you know, see the books behind me, and a couple of those really thick books are medical textbooks, and nowhere in them can you open it up and find a passage that says, don't spit on the OR floor. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, in other words, it's just assumed that everybody knows that from the ethic and everything around practicing medicine and hygiene and that sort of thing. We are not at a place where we can assume anymore that people know what God stands for and what he is against. Um, and, and so we have to begin to articulate that, and we have to figure out new ways to do that. <clears throat> yeah. Well, my guest today has been Matthew Sleeth, medical doctor and author of some very fascinating books that I've really enjoyed, 24-6 uh, and uh, Reforcing Faith, and, and now the author of a difficult but very, very important book, Hope Always, How to Be a Force for Life in a Culture of Suicide. He'll be joining us in Fort Worth, Texas in May uh, for the Wilberforce Weekend, uh, and I hope you will join us. Uh, seats are filling up quickly. Uh, we do have uh, some some tickets remaining. There's a handful of hotel rooms remaining, but it's going to be a full-on event. And what we're doing is looking uh, from as many different angles as we possibly can, both theological, philosophical, cultural, and then also when it comes to mission and uh, living out our faith, this idea of the image of God and the difference that it makes in our worldview and in our cultural witness. So uh, Matthew, it's great to have this conversation uh, with you. I'm very grateful that you will be joining us uh, in Fort Worth and at, for Wilberforce Weekend. Uh, it is, um, you, you know, we, we often talk about that we don't get to choose the times and places in which we live, that God puts us in times and places. And let me just read again this proverb that I think applies to you, applies to your book, and hopefully will apply to all of us who attend Wilberforce. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. 
hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we did not know this, he who weighs the heart perceives it. Uh, That should sink in. Matthew, good to see you, my friend, and we'll see you in a little bit over a month in Fort Worth, Texas. Really looking forward to it. Wilberforce Weekend has always been and is about equipping Christians, equipping you with the clarity, confidence, and courage you need to live out what is true in this cultural moment. The Colson Center is also offering the Wilberforce Weekend online. This is a virtual conference that will be released in the month of June. You can engage with the entire content of the Wilberforce Weekend from your own home. And better yet, we'll have special sessions that are online only that will only be specifically for the virtual attendees. Join us at the Wilberforce Weekend and let's work together on what it means to get the image of God right and to join in God's restoring work.